Welcome to the Central Universe. Xenon stood on the terrace overlooking the Venusian gardens while marveling at the beauty observed from above. While Xenon had viewed the various flower and water displays countless times before, the extraordinary panorama of beauty always provided a new visual experience. Interwoven with the vast flower and water displays were wood, metal, and rock sculptures of various designs. Taken from creations across the multiverse, the various flower species provided exquisite color combinations that created a breathtaking luminosity. The water fountain displays and associated pools of liquid were mesmerizing as dazzling multicolored water sprayed about in complex and colorful patterns, creating a meditative state when watched for any length of time. Along with the vibrant color patterns of both the flowers and the water displays, ancient esoteric symbology etched into the sculptures released powerful knowledge and powers to the observer. One could not stare at the Minutian gardens without discovering new insights and re-energizing their vital consciousness essence. As with any new venture taken, Xenon used the time at the special garden to help create new insights for the upcoming journey to the outer rim of creation. Xenon pre pre predominantly inhabited Um and was a member of what was considered the primary universal race. The Um world was located in the central or first universe. As attested by the Venusian gardens, Um was the embodiment of the greatest of all creations. Due to the incredible and antiquity of the um world all matter on um was very malleable and could take on any shape or form as desired by its primary universal residents the primary universal race was the oldest race in the multiverse and they had collectively created um to be their home world both um and its inhabitants were forever consciously connected while every being that made up the central or primary race were indeed individual consciousnesses, they were also connected to each other through a shared subconscious mind. Due to the shared consciousness, verbal communication was not necessary between members of the first race. In fact, most communication between the beings of the primary universal race involved symbols and images conveyed mind to mind. Each of these primordial beings existed beyond eternity and were all immortal in the sense that they never died. The actual truth was that every other sentient being in the multiverse was also immortal, but could still experience physical death. Some of the main responsibilities of the primary universals were building and maintaining worlds and being the depositors of knowledge pertaining to absolute law and true reality. To this end, the central race had created a grand central complex for monitoring worlds and all relevant data pertaining to these worlds. The technologies and methods to achieve this extremely complex task were beyond comprehension. In layman's terms, extremely sophisticated technologies were employed at each world for monitoring and gathering data that was constantly conveyed to the central complex on UM for storage and retrieval as desired. In addition to being master scientists and engineers, all members of the first race were master adepts of absolute law and the esoteric knowledge and skills associated with working within the framework of absolute law. Due to the ancient wisdom possessed by each member of the central race, these special entities had the ability to achieve what many races would consider to be magical or godly in nature. Ancient wisdom concerning absolute law was conveyed to each world's race through the strategic placement of esoteric knowledge on each respective planet and through conscious interactions between primary universals and select entities that were part of their consciousness framework. 
Inside the central complex, Xenon stared at the hologram of the pre-terraformed world currently catalogued as PT-017735. Located on the current outer rim of creation, PT-017735 was one of the countless worlds soon to be terraformed. These pre-terraformed worlds were in optimum positions in their respective solar systems to support biological life. Sometimes the primary universals in charge of these new, new worlds would let evolution play its part in developing life on these planets. Depending on complex variables, other worlds would become candidates for terraforming to speed up evolution on those planets. The selection committee for terraforming had determined that PT-017735 was a viable candidate. The committee requested that Xenon lead the expedition to PT-017735. Even to the other members of the primary universals, Xenon was considered an elder. Along with numerous master disciplines in the sciences, Xenon was a master geneticist. Preferring to communicate audibly, Elder Hadassan came up to Xenon and said, We are all so glad that you have agreed to lead and become Doyon for the mission to PT-017735. After a slight pause from staring at the New World's hologram, Xenon replied, Thank you, Haddison. It has been quite a while since I've been part of such a mission. I believe the journey will be both refreshing and revealing. The committee has selected the finest crew to assist you for this important mission, declared Haddison. I'm very appreciative of the committee's diligent and cur curating the right members for this expedition. I realize as chair for the selection committee, you were instrumental in the selections, replied Xenon to the elder Haddison. All primary universals were capable of teleportation to any portion of the multiverse. Due to the extreme distance and conditions surrounding the home galaxy of this new world, the committee and all responsible members for this exploration had decided that a starship would be the most prudent and useful option. The starship selected for this mission was Bioclass. Like many first world creation, the ship possessed a consciousness of its own. Fully created with the most advanced technologies, this incredible vessel was capable of interfacing with its crew on conscious and subconscious levels. The Android pre-launch crew began final preparations, equipment loading, and pre-flight inspections to ensure the craft would be ready to depart the next day. In conjunction with the Starship groundwork crew, all ship crew members had ensured the necessary equipment and knowledge bases were in place for the next day's mission departure. Even though the Android crew was extremely capable and thorough, Xenon preferred to perform a final inspection and inventory of all equipment that would be used on the mission. After checking and cataloging all equipment and instruments and inputting all necessary data into the biosuits and the Starship's memory cores, Xenon headed out the exit to go home and prep the living space for the extended absence. Walking off the Bioclass Starship, Xenon met one of the crew missions crew members coming up into the craft. Master Xenon, so unexpected to see here, you here so late, spoke Tannen. I was just finishing up some final inspections and inventory. I hope your work here does not take too long. Due to the possible length of this mission, everyone is taking time to ensure all their affairs are in order. That is where I'm going now, said Xenon. My affairs are simple. I am very honored to serve on this mission under your guidance, Doyon. I will see you at launch, said Tannen, before continuing up the gangway past Xenon and into the ship. At the bottom of the gangway, Xenon stopped for a few seconds and stared out briefly before continuing to the transport terminal. As with the nature of most manifestations, 
energy was always expended when primary universals used consciousness to transport their physical essence. For that reason, most primaries preferred to use technological creations whenever possible. Once at the living space, Xenon consumes some vital nutrients to keep the physical essence in prime condition for the journey before instructing the space's AI on the completion of all necessary endeavors while away on the mission. With all personal affairs in order, Xenon sat, sat upright and cross-legged on the meditation mat to begin the journey into the multiverse. Deep into the void, multiple dots of brilliant light appeared in the utter darkness of the emptiness of this special place. Once conscious awareness on a dot of light occurred, Xenon's mind and essence would connect and be pulled to that brilliant orb of energy. With all crew members aboard the starship's consciousness, the starship's consciousness informed everyone that departure was imminent. The bioclass starship proceeded to rise past UM's planetary shield and into the darkness of space. Once at a safe departure location, the shipboard artificial intelligence plotted the route to PT-017735 and initiated the first of multiple jumps through the wormhole portals required to reach their destination. Due to the incredibly vast distance between the central universe and PT-017735, even an advanced starship traveling at faster than light speeds would have taken millions of years to reach this destination at the outer edge of creation. Fortunately, the starships developed by the central race were like no other, and an otherwise unlikely journey was indeed possible. Even aboard a bioclass starship with the most sophisticated navigation and propulsion systems available anywhere within the multiverse, the journey would require a week in linear time to reach PT-017735. Viewed from the main shipboard monitor, the plotted course to PT-017735 looked like a vast web of interleaking multidimensional lines and dots on the screen. Most of the route was not even part of the central universe. The starship would be traveling through multiple universes in an intricate pattern of wormhole jumps and FTL travel within each universe. While the rest of the team had opted to go into cryo sleep for the long journey to the outer reaches of the multiverse, Xenon decided to take the time to meditate and tap into the infinite knowledge base that was part of universal consciousness. As Doyon, he also felt an obligation to be available for anything that might come up during the journey. Once everyone else had retired to their respective cryo chambers and initiated cryo sleep, Xenon performed a quick inspection walk around the ship before retiring to the cabin reserved for the Doyon. Instructing the AI to dim the lights and initiate the Lycium flower fragrance smell, Xenon sat down at the meditation mat to start the journey to all that is and the vast wisdom contained within absolute reality. Whenever he initiated these learning wayfarers, Xenon would first review the fundamentals. Once inside the void, Xenon directed his conscious awareness to locate the funda fundamental laws of reality. Immediately, Xenon's mind was transported to the vast inner chambers of the Kabbalah Shan, containing countless tunnels and chambers carved within a small planetary body in the first universe. The Kabbalah Shan was the archive for all known knowledge in the multiverse. Carved on the granite walls were innumerable ancient texts and symbols that relayed extensive amounts of information concerning absolute reality in the extremely vast and sometimes complex knowledge found throughout the known existence. Along with the stone inscriptions, the Kabbalah Shan contained boundless physical and etheric volumes of knowledge and information. Exploring the countless chambers and tunnels, Xenon stopped the mind travel at a specific chamber. Displayed on huge slabs of smooth granite were the seven fundamental principles of truth that made up all relative and absolute law. 
Zenon started the lesson by reviewing each of the principles displayed. <clears throat> Dis displayed in brilliant gold inlay were the inscriptions. One, the principle of mind of all. Two, the principle of conformity. Three, the principle of resonance. Four, the principle of duality. Five, the principle of pattern. Six, the principle of circumstance. And seven, the principle of gender. Under each of the seven principles were profound words that conveyed powerful truths. Settling the mind to fully embrace the truth set forth, Xenon began to read more from beneath each principle shown in the beautiful granite slabs. Due to the nature of this special place, the writings entered the mind in a way that produced deeper understandings. Under the first principle, words imparted the great truth that all physical matter and the underlying energy that forms this matter are all creations of infinite mind. Those who understood this mighty concept could use this master key to unlock the vast power and knowledge associated with the principle of mind of all. Once the wisdom of the master key principle was fully understood, Xenon moved on to the second principle. The principle of conformity was indeed an underlying principle for all of creation. Within this all-powerful truth was a notion that all planes of existence share common aspects with each other. The compelling truths, as above, so below, and as within, so without, showed the true power to create personal and consensual reality within everyone, just as an infinite mind creates the all that is. Moving on to the third principle of residence, Xenon was once again reminded how the entire creation from the mind of all that is was in co a constant state of motion. From the highest aspects of universal spirit to the lowest forms of matter, there existed vast amounts of varying degrees of vibratory rates of motion. The higher rate of vibration, the closer to so the source of all that is. Next, Xenon once again explored the principle of duality. This enlightening principle embodied the truth that all like physical and mental phenomena have two sides. Hot and cold, light and dark, and love and hate were all examples of this universal principle. While this powerful principle could be applied to both the physical and the mental, the utilization of this valve valuable principle of polarity on the mental plane allowed master adepts the ability to transcend their current mental states, even sometimes changing that of others when necessary. With the first four principles reviewed once more, Xenon went on to explore the last three of the seven powerful principles. The fifth principle of pattern incorporated the truth that all physical and mental creations have a measured motion that has a tide-like ebb and flow. The pendulum-like movement embodied in this principle showed how the relationships between the different states represented by the principle of duality are in constant motion from one state to the other. Just as positive moves, moods can become negative if not consciously looked after, fear could be turned into courage by one who consciously controlled the swing of their thoughts through the power of will. Xenon moved into the sixth principle of circumstance. The powerful principle encapsulated the mighty truth that there was always a cause for every effect and there was no such thing as chance. Because everything happened in keeping with absolute law, masters of the principle of cause and effect learned how to rise to higher planes of existence to overcome the laws and effects associated with lower planes of existence. Instead of being pulled along by their current environments and the wills of others, true masters learned how to escape the effects of any plane and instead became masters of the game of life by converting themselves to causers of reality. Once through the first six principles, Xenon went on to examine the final and seventh principle of gender. 
Within this truth was the concept that everything was composed of the masculine and feminine. And this powerful truth embodies the physical, mental, and spiritual planes. On the physical plane, this axiom manifests as sex, while the principal gender takes on other forms in the higher mental and spiritual planes. Using this powerful principle, both male and female masters throughout the ages have been able to use their conscious minds, the masculine, to mentally intend their creative subconscious minds, the feminine, to birth their aspirations and goals into existence. With the study of the seven fundamental principles complete and fresh in the mind, Xenon explored the Kabbalah Shan further to help with the upcoming issues to be faced on the journey and those that might be encountered in the near future. Between studies within the Kabbalah Shan and work aboard the starship preparing for the terraforming operation on P2, PT017735, the week's travel across the multiverse went by quickly for Xenon. As the bio-class starship neared its destination, the starship's consciousness entered the subconscious minds of all crew members in biostasis to inform them of the approaching arrival at PT-017735. With each crew member's consent, the ship's AI began the process of awaking them from their earlier induced cryosleep. After waking from the extended sleep, each crew member absorbed some vital nutrients to re-energize their physical forms in preparation for the upcoming work on PT-017735. Soon, the starship began to, its descent through the still forming atmosphere on PT-017735. The first stop would be one of many upper plateau regions located in the northern and southern hemisphere of the newly informed planet system. From the higher elevation of these plateaus, the team would deposit a specially developed genetic mixture into the streams cur currently running through the upper plateaus and down into the valleys below. Like multiple fingers spreading out over the plateaus, these initial streams would carry the vital life-producing elementals down across vast landscapes until they reached the planet's oceans. Along its journey to the sea, the specially developed mixture of genetic material would combine with the planet's water system to produce even more of the extremely complex blend of genetic substance. Once the water from the upper plateaus reached the oceans, natural and bioengineered cloud and wind formations would pull some of the ocean's water up into the upper atmosphere to be transported and redeposited as rain throughout the planet's land masses. Mixing with the natural soils of the newly formed planet, this extraordinary combination of extremely advanced bioengineered medium would cause an accelerated growth of various plant and tree life across the globe. Due to the nature of this radically engineered substance, Full terraforming of the planet would be accomplished in as little as six months. After depositing the initial genetic mixtures into the streams, the team would wait a few weeks before using sophisticated equipment to begin the process of creating the weather patterns needed to pull the newly formed substance out of the oceans and into the upper atmosphere for spreading across the planet's continents. With possible weather extremes in the not fully formed atmosphere on PT-017735, all team members on this mission would wear a biosuit for protection. Thus began the first part of the mission, with multiple stops to embed the genetic mixture into multiple streams across multiple plateaus. After three days on this task, Xenon was pleased with the progress. A couple more days and all the initial stream germinating should be complete, thought the doyon as he rested in his quarters. Xenon detected a presence at the door. Please come in, Tanon. Walking into Xenon's cabin, Tanon said, Good evening, doyon. I hope I'm not disturbing you. Not at all. What is on your mind? Master Xenon, 
I've been going over the shipboard maps of the planet. I believe it might be prudent to take a quick shuttle flight th through tomorrow's planned distribution areas to ensure we do not miss any vital tributaries. After taking a few seconds to ponder Tanon's request, Xenon responded. As second in command, I value your judgment. Would you like me to assign someone to go with you? I plan to only be gone a short while, so I don't feel assistance will be necessary. Very well. Please update the shipboard maps on anything you find beyond the initial mission parameters. Thank you, and I will update as necessary, Master Xenon, said Tanon, before nodding to the Xenon and leaving the cabin. Arriving at one of the plateaus on the planet's southern hemisphere, the crew disembarked from the vessel and headed towards the first stream slated for implantation of the genetic mi mixture that day. Once a water sample had been taken and examined to be a good base for the genetic medium, Xenon pulled a vial of the bioengineered trans terraforming substance from the mobile kit and prepared to inject the mixture into the stream. Leaning down and placing the calibrated syringe of solution into the water, Xenon began to push the material into the stream. Suddenly, he felt a sharp pain as something came through the sleeve of his biosuit and immediately entered the bloodstream of the physical body form. Falling back to the ground, he could feel the mind begin to go into total darkness. Master Xenon, are you all right? cried one of the crew as Xenon lay in what appeared to be unconsciousness on the ground by the stream. The team carried Xenon back to the starship to be connected to the ship's medical diagnostic systems for evaluation and treatment as necessary. After reviewing the initial medical diagnostics, the shipboard AI revealed that while most of Xenon's physical body appeared to be functioning normal, the brain had entered an extremely deep coma state. Laron, the team's main physician, tried to contact him using telepathic means but was unable to cross the veil of his mind. Meeting in the ship's lounge area, the team began to discuss all options. While the ship's artificial intelligence con continues to look for clues on how and why Xenon's mind is not accessible, I am concerned that further damage could occur if we do not get our doyon back to um as soon as possible, exclaimed Lorian. Some of the other crew members nodded in agreement. Tanon looked towards Laron and the rest of the crew. Laron, I fully respect and value your opinion on this matter. Currently, it does appear that a majority of Xenon's physical systems are functioning normal. Based on this, I do feel that we should try to complete the initial stream germinations and set the atmospheric conditions into motion to allow a chance at starting the terraforming process on PT-017735. I am concerned for our doyon. We really do not understand what might be happening in Xenon's mind, argued Laron. Once again, I believe it is vital that we complete the initial parameters of this mission before heading back. The Starship's AI is connected to Xenon and will inform us all if anything new comes up. As mission commander now, I have made the decision to continue the mission for the time being, said Tana, before directing the crew to prepare for the next stream genetic implantation. By the end of the second day since Xenon's collapse at the stream, the team hurriedly finished the remaining stream deposits. Over the following week, the team prepared the artificial weather generating equipment to begin the process of ocean water evaporation, condensation in the atmosphere, and sub subsequent precipitation over the planet's land masses. The ship's AI continued to report Xenon's stable condition. With everything in place, the weather generators and natural biospheric actions began to produce the rain clouds necessary to deposit the terraforming mixture across the planet's surface. With the terraforming process now sufficiently started and Xenon's physical status still indicating stable, Tanon instructed the crew and starship 
to prepare for the return journey to Am. Earth Verse Contradictions of Thought Present Day Boulder, Colorado That was strange. Those words felt so real. What did they mean? Contemplated Matt as he laid looking up at the ceiling. I wish they were here now so we could talk about this. Matt yearned as thoughts of his parents came to mind. Not particularly religious, Matt said a short prayer for his parents before finally drifting off to sleep. After a restless night pondering the previous event at last night's Krav Maga class, an irritating alarm made Matt jolt awake. Smacking the alarm clock to silence it, Matt saw it read 7 a.m. and groaned to himself. The first class for the day was advanced calculus at 8 a.m. Matt quickly jumped out of bed to get ready. Wednesday's schedule was both grueling and fascinating. Along with a math class and general chemistry in the morning, Matt would spend the afternoon doing lab work for his quantum mechanics course. After grabbing some quick coffee and toast, Matt reached for his backpack and bolted out the door. Normally he'd ride his mountain bike to class. Running late, he had ordered an Uber ride. Pulling up to the Colorado University of Boulder front entrance, Matt quickly paid the Uber driver and ran up the steps before going inside. Glad you could join us, Mr. Larson, laminated Professor Johnson as Matt quickly took a seat. Fortunately, he was a good student so his lateness would go no further than his public call out this time. As the professor continued his lecture on the Fubinini theorem, Matt sat staring at the overhead in front of him while his mind was elsewhere. What previous lessons should I be remembering? And why is it so important? Pondered Matt as he continued to stare at the overheads. Maybe Julia and Dan can help me figure this out when we meet for lunch thought Matt as he attempted to refocus his mind on Professor Johnson's lecture. Soon, the math class was over. After an uneventful chemistry class, Matt headed outside to meet Dan and Julia. Hey there, beautiful, Matt called out as he walked over to Julia and Dan. Why, thank you, handsome, joked Dan as Matt put his arm around Julia and gave her a big kiss. Oh, you're beautiful too, Matt, teased his longtime friend as he took Julia's hand. Julia looked at her two male companions. So where should we go for lunch today? How about Dionys? Today is two for one pizza and beer, said Dan while rubbing his stomach. Pizza sounds great, but no beer for me. I have an important lab later, replied Matt. Then it's settled, boys declared Julia before they all started walking towards one of their favorite restaurants. Damn, this pizza smells good and tastes incredible, exclaimed Dan as he devoured the meat lover's pizza just brought to their table. So did your morning go okay, Matt? Dan filled me in on last night's incident at Krav Maga, inquired Julia to her boyfriend of two years. Yeah, I'm okay. But I did want to talk with you two about what occurred when I passed out, answered Matt. No problem, buddy. What's on your mind? Asked Dan before taking a swig from his beer mug. Well, it's funny you should ask about what's on my mind because I actually heard a voice in my head after I blacked out last night, replied Matt. Really? So what did this voice say to you? Julie asked. This unknown voice in my head said that I must leave for a while, but I should remember some sort of lessons from the past. The table was silent for a while as everyone pondered the words Matt had heard in his head. Dan looked at Matt and said, maybe you're supposed to recall some of your martial arts lessons from before we started training in Krav Maga. Maybe, but this kind of felt like it was something intellectual that I should remember, replied Matt. I remember you telling me a few times about the lessons your parents gave you when you were younger, Julia recalled. Yeah, that might be it, said Matt, as he began to recall the esoteric wisdom his parents had continuously tried to drill into him when he was younger. Well, Matt's dad 
had been a physicist and his mom a psychiatrist, both of his parents were avid students of ancient esoteric teachings surrounding the nature of reality. It was Matt's parents who introduced him to meditation during that time. While not remembering most of their earlier teachings, Matt did try to meditate as often as he could. Matt nodded to himself before looking at the attractive and athletic young woman seated next to him. Thanks for reminding me about those earlier teachings. While it's all still kind of fuzzy, that may be what I'm supposed to remember. I just wish I knew who and what this strange voice was. You're welcome, babe. Maybe we could get together later at your place and watch some Netflix, Julia coyly suggested as they all got up and headed out of the restaurant. I would love that, shot back Mac, as they walked outside. They all stood just outside the restaurant on the sidewalk. Well, I'll see you two lovebirds later. I've actually got this cool Python program waiting for me at home, Dan told his two friends before walking off down the street towards his apartment. See you later, computer geek. Hope you have fun with that tonight, laughed Matt as he and Julia headed back the other direction towards campus. As Matt walked into the quantum mechanics lab, his spirits rose as he pondered what new concept he might learn that day. While pursuing a degree in physics was a grueling task, learning about the underlying structure of matter and energy was interesting to him. Matt and his lab partners would be performing the now famous double split experiment. The basic premise of the experiment was to show that light and even matter can display characteristics of both waves and particles at the same time. As Matt and his lab partner shined a light at the plate with two slits, a rear screen started to capture particle points behind each, screen, each slit as expected. Over time, an interface pattern on the rear screen showed what the light going through the two separate slits was recombining to form more of a wave type pattern into the rear screen. Just as the results of this experiment had shown countless other times, Matt and his lab partners once again demonstrated the principle of wave particle duality. Later that evening, Matt answered the knock at his apartment door and found his best friend standing outside the door in a sexy black dress, revealing the loveliest legs he had ever seen. Well, hello, beautiful. Please come in, said Matt as he gestured for Julia to come inside. I hope you like this wine. It's a new red I thought might be nice to try, said Julia as she walked through the door. You and the wine look spectacular, exclaimed Matt. I hope Chinese food is okay. Sounds perfect, said Julia as she headed to the kitchen to find a wine bottle opener. After a dinner of Chinese food and wine, Matt and Julia retired to the couch. Cuddled on Matt's chest, Julia asked, Have you put any more thought into those words you heard in your head? I think it may have something to do with my childhood lessons, so I want to start checking that out. Right now, I have something far more important to check out, answered Matt as he began to rub Julia's inner thigh. Feeling restless later that night, Matt quietly rose from beds, so he would not wake Julia. Opening the laptop at his desk, Matt began searching the term esoteric wisdom to see if he could jog his memory. As Matt began researching material surrounding his childhood lessons, memory of his parents came to mind again. A quick search once more revealed the original Denver Post article that recounted the tragic accident his parents had while traveling Colorado's Million Dollar Highway on US 550 between the small towns of Durango and Uray almost four years ago. While this route could indeed be treacherous at times and would be closed often during the winter months, Matt's parents had drove this stretch of highway many times before and the time of the accident was early summer. Matt had questioned many things concerning the accident but the response from local authorities did not seem to offer any decent answers. 
The first responders to the accident said the vehicle had been traveling faster than it should have on that curve before it went over the steep cliff. And after most likely rolling over numerous times, the vehicle had burst into flames in the gorge floor below. Authorities had also indicated that due to the intense heat from the flames, both bodies in the car had been reduced to ash by the time rescuers arrived at the final crash site. After waiting a couple days for the investigation to be completed, Matt was given what remained of his mother and father. Totally grief-stricken, Matt drove back to, to the family home in Denver. All the way back to Denver, Matt continued to try and make sense of the tragedy and come to grips with the terrible loss he now faced. This does not seem real. I just can't believe they are gone, thought Matt as he continued towards Denver. Once back in Denver, Matt remained days throughout the funeral arrangements and burial. It was not until three months later that Matt finally came to terms with the fact that his parents were not going to return. Matt had already been accepted at CU of Boulder before his parents' death. He pondered whether he should continue with those plans. After much soul searching and encouragement from family on both sides, Matt decided that attending college had always been his parents' wish and he would be able to honor them by moving forward with his original intention. After the sale of the family home and proceeds from life insurance claims, Matt was able to pay his entire tuition obligation and still have money to support himself while he attended the university. After reliving the old memories of his parents' deaths, Matt thought to himself, I'm not sure where this will lead. For my parents' sake and memory, I must once again pursue this path I started with my parents so long ago. With new purpose, Matt began to dig into the many sites that had come up during his search of the term esoteric wisdom. Present day New Haven, Connecticut. As a political science undergraduate, stu undergraduate student at Yale University, Thomas P. Halloway IV was most likely headed for a career in politics. Currently serving as student body president, he'd already started making connections with both key students and Yale alumni members. Armed with a quick wit and strong intellect, he was popular with his fellow students and most of the faculty at Yale. As a fifth generation Halloway, Thomas was from a family of wealth and influence. The Halloway family fortune was originally made in the trades business and now Halloway Enterprises span the globe with divisions in retail trade and manufacturing. While well, most of the Halloways ended up in the family business, Thomas's parents felt that his charming personality and above average intellect would best serve Halloway Enterprises in the political arena. He happily agreed with his parents' wishes and began preparing for his future at an early age. We still on tonight for the Ellis Club, Stuart called out to Thomas as they crossed paths in the hallway. Absolutely, my Scottish hunk of a friend, replied Thomas. Awesome. Been looking forward to finding some hookups and prime Scotch whiskey, shouted Stuart as Thomas continued down the hall to his next class. While the usual college party scene was not of huge interest to Thomas, he would occasionally set one of the many invitations he got so that he could expand his network of connections. Along with being popular with Yale students, the Ellis Club was also a favorite gathering place for Yale faculty and alumni members. The name Ellis was a nickname referred to Elihu Yale, a Welsh merchant for whom Yale College was named in 1718. It was of no surprise that the Ellis Club embodied everything that made the Ivy League University what it was. Even for the elite members of society, walking into the Ellis Club was a treat to the senses. Using a combination of both old and new, the Ellis Club spoke both old money and high-tech design throughout its spacious and decadent main lounge and adjoining private meeting areas. Modern alternative rock 
while it's currently pumping through the elaborate sound and speaker system. These sounds would switch to popular dance hits as the evening progressed and pretty college co-eds began moving to the dance floor. As Thomas walked through the huge mahogany entrance doors, he too could not help but be amazed at the spectacle in front of him. Thirty to forty young and chic people in very expensive clothes were already moving about the grand lounge, engaged in conversation and laughter. In the adjoining more private areas of the club, older, more distinguished gentlemen and ladies could be seen smoking cigars and drinking wine while engaging in what was most likely business and political talk. Hey, Thomas, come on over. I want to introduce you to a couple new friends, exclaimed Stewart as he gestured to two very lovely young college students. Having already downed a couple McCallum single malts, Stuart was already feeling festive and talkative. Thomas, please meet Catherine and Jessica. Well, hello, ladies. It's a pleasure to meet you both, said Thomas as he reached out to give each of his fellow Yale students a quick hug. You have outdone yourself, my man, Thomas whispered in Stuart's ears as he gave his friend a hug. I thought you might like. They are freshmen, too, Stuart whispered back. Catherine smiled at Thomas. You're Thomas Halloway. I've seen your face on posters all over campus. Yes, they are probably old campaign posters, laughed Thomas as he smiled back at Catherine. You must be majoring in political science, being student body president and all, inquired Catherine. I am indeed. Are you interested in politics, Catherine? Thomas asked the young co-ed. I'm interested in some aspects of politics, Catherine coyly replied. Another fellow classmate came up to Thomas and whispered in his ear, Senator Goldstein is in the other room. She would like to meet you to discuss a proposition. Thomas looked towards the two young women. I'm so sorry, ladies, but I must leave for a bit. Please, by all means, stick around if you can. I'm sure my big hunk friend here can get you both another drink if you want. Thomas put his hand on Stuart's shoulder and smiled before turning to leave with the senator's assistant. It would be my pleasure, ladies, Stuart assured his two new friends as he gestured, gestured to the bartender. Thomas walked over to Senator Goldstein's table with the senator's assistant. He reached out his hand towards the senator sitting with an entourage of people. It's such a pleasure to finally meet you, Senator. I'm a huge fan of your work on the Wetlands Environmental Act. It's wonderful to meet you as well, Mr. Halloway, replied the Senator as she looked Thomas up and down. I asked Lance to track you down when I heard you might be here tonight. Please sit down with us and have a drink, said Senator Goldstein as she guessed gestured for Thomas to have a seat. As she poured him a glass of wine, Senator Goldstein put her hand on Thomas's hand and said, Since Karen left, we have been searching for a new assistant to help with various matters. I've been hearing good things about you. I wanted to meet to see if you might be a good candidate for the position. Obviously, I'm a bit biased, but I don't think you'll find any, anyone more capable or willing to do whatever it takes to keep you happy and successful, joked Thomas as he stared into the senator's eyes. Well then, Mr. Holloway, you have definitely created a great first impression. Let me think on the matter and we'll be in touch, remarked the senator as she picked up her phone to call her driver. Once Senator Goldstein and her entourage left, Thomas headed back to hook up with Stuart and his two lovely new friends. In full party mode now, Stuart and the two gorgeous young ladies were dancing together on the expensive maple dance floor. Thomas danced up behind Catherine while moving in close. As Catherine pushed her well-rounded butt up against him, he reached both hands around her waist as they began to bump and grind to the dance music. Wow, this is a very nice place you have, Thomas Holloway, exclaimed Catherine as she walked into the bungalow Thomas owned in Morris Cove. 
Well, thank you. You'll have to stay the night so we can get breakfast on the Harborough waterside in the morning, replied Thomas as he closed the door. So is that the line you use with all your guests? asked Catherine as she began to take off her jacket. Thomas smiled at the beautiful co-ed and said, only the beautiful, sexy, and interesting ones. He took off his jacket and threw it over the couch. Already worked up from the steamy dancing at the club, it was not long before both Thomas and Catherine undressed each other. She unzipped his pants and began to pleasure him. After a short time, Thomas playfully threw Catherine back onto the sofa. After removing her pretty lace panties, he put his head between her legs and gave her the first orgasm of the night. Flipping her onto her stomach, he entered her and began to rhythmically thrust his engorged member inside. Catherine soon succumbed to a strange force that almost made her pass out. While the experience was arousing and made her orgasm, something inside felt strange. As Thomas continued moving inside her, she could hear guttural sounds coming from him until he growled loudly and ejaculated. Finished, Thomas rolled over onto his back and dozed off. As her mind started to clear, Catherine lay beside the young heir, heir to the Halloway fortune looking up at the ceiling. That was so strange. It felt like someone else was there with us. A short while later, Thomas woke to the sounds of Catherine quietly getting dressed. Leaving so soon? I thought we were going to get breakfast in the morning. I have a early class, muttered Catherine as she quickly finished putting on her shoes and started for the door. Perhaps we can do this again soon, asked Thomas as a wicked smile came over his face. Hurrying out the door, Catherine did not respond or look back. She headed out to the street to catch the Uber she had called as the front door slammed shut behind her. Feeling very satisfied, Thomas rolled onto his side and fell back to sleep. Thomas woke to warm morning sun shining into the bedroom. Grabbing some English muffins and orange juice, he went out to the rear deck to take in the harbor and the boat sailing in the distance. I think today would be a great day to get out there and see things from the other side, he thought as he continued to stare out at the harbor. Soon a bing sounded on his phone. Looking at the new text, Thomas saw the letters and numbers. DOH830. The cryptic test text indicated that he would be going somewhere later that evening. After finishing breakfast, Thomas walked down to the docks until he came upon a small sailing vessel called World's Mine. Climbing aboard, he released the moorings. The boat began to drift away from the dock. He used a small trolling motor to get the vessel aligned with a slight breeze before engaging the sails. Soon the sailing vessel began to pick up speed as it headed out further into the harbor. Thomas piloted the vessel north past the east shore and as the wind shifted, he steered the vessel south past Lighthouse Point Park. He always enjoyed taking his boat out into the waters. The sea was the one place he could get away from all the responsibilities the Halloway name carried. While he loved his family, there were times that being a Halloway carried burdens he was not always comfortable with. As water lapped against the side of the boat and sea breeze lightly touched his face, Thomas began to feel very relaxed. Soon after, the ringing of his phone brought him out of his meditative state. Hi, this is Thomas. Hi, Thomas. This is Senator Goldstein's aide, Lance. The senator would like to meet at her office in Washington later next week to go over your new responsibilities. We will be in touch once we have a firm date and time. Thank you, Lance. Please tell Senator Goldstein I look forward to our meeting. I will, Mr. Halloway. Have a good day. A smile came over Thomas's face as he contemplated his this great opportunity. Steering the vessel back towards the dock, he began to prepare his mind for the events later that evening. 